Uh, I will uh, invite uh, yeah, Professor Tandon, sir. Uh, we all know him. There is no need of introduction. But one thing I would like to highlight this uh, 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 before inviting him. And many times when I discuss with, uh, with the student or with the younger colleagues, we are saying that uh, there are the different approaches or the science is growing in a different aspect and, and in the different directions. But uh, the thing is that uh, 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 the concern comes that this uh, the specialization is the limitation, and they have done the uh, PhD on the, the, in the limited part. But uh, uh, I would like to highlight uh, uh, the sir who has did his uh, PhD in the sedimentology area. And then after that, uh, he moved uh, in the Cretaceous rocks. And in, in the Cretaceous rocks, he, uh, he worked out the paleogeography of those regions, which, were, uh, which was yeah, at that time uh, 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 habited by the dinosaurs, which has provided a new set of understanding. And then uh, his next set of research has moved to, the, uh, to again, in the uh, Cenozoic rocks of the Shivaliks, where the uh, initiation of the paleomech uh, data has been initiated. After that, the move was there towards the quaternary sediments uh, of the, of the Thar, Thar Desert, where, where the uh, fluvial sequences in the desert area has been worked out. And that was also the initial point where the uh, extensive amount of the OSL data was used in the fluvial systems. And then after that, we, ha we all know about the extensive work on the quaternary sediment of the Ganga Plain. And it was at that time when, uh, uh, when the, there was a general belief that the yellow color alluvial plain is not relevant for, for the geology people. And, uh, and now we have the uh, detailed history of the Ganga Plain evolutions. And uh, uh, followed of this work, uh, uh, his work was on the active tectonics in the Northwest Himalaya. And at present, he is now interested in the river science and the Anthropocene, means working on the uh, modern day processes. So time scale doesn't uh, yeah, mat matter. It is the research is all about the leadership, and that we would like to convey. And uh, so his work at the million scale to millennial scale to the modern time scale, all these things are relevant, and they are giving the direction to the science. And with these things, I invite sir to uh, 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 to give a talk on the Anthropocene the aspect, which is a new multidimensional area, and where, again, what's, uh, where the geoscience com community lies. So. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Vikrant, for inviting me and for the kind words, a brief resume of what I have done in life. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I have kind of... Uh, every now and then um, switched from one kind of work to another kind of work. Uh, I've had a long career, about five decades. And uh, 10 years is long enough to be with one, one field area. You know, you get bored and then you move on, actually. <laughs> so I think that is the reason why I'm now uh, kind of playing around with uh, rivers, which are certainly one of the most important things on, on the uh, Earth's surface. You don't have rivers or active rivers on Mars. You don't have active rivers on Moon. And you know what their condition is. There is no biosphere. <clears throat> and if you look at the population maps of the world, you will find that most of the river valleys are occupied by human beings, essentially. <clears throat> so what I'm going to try and do this afternoon is take you through, sometimes I would call it a biased journey, my own perspective of how I view the Earth's surface. And since you have been talking about the Earth's surface over the last two weeks, I will not burden you too much with that, and then try and move on to the Anthropocene concept and the relevance of the Anthropocene con concept in the context of the Earth's surface systems. <clears throat> now, if you look at the Earth's surface, and by now I'm sure over these last two weeks and earlier, you're pretty much clear that the Earth's surface is defined or governed by tectonics, by climate, erosion, and their interactions. That's, humans are still not around, actually, playing into this. This has been going on for a long time, right from, uh, let's say, four billion years of time, essentially. But the Earth's surface was very different in the past. Then you have nature and man come in, actually, and the human transformations. And that's where the Anthropocene concept comes in, actually. And what is the Anthropocene concept actually doing to this interacting system of tectonics, climate, and, and erosion, actually? And I think that is the 
critical thing, and that is where the next few decades of research in Earth surface processes is going to be grounded, actually. <clears throat> so let's first just talk about the Earth's surface. Imagine that we're talking about the Earth's surface without human beings now. There are no human beings on Earth. So our follies, our actions are not impacting the surface of the Earth. <clears throat> so when, when that kind of a world was there, we're talking about the Earth and its fluid envelopes mediated by the biosphere. So you have the hydrosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere, and the atmosphere all as interacting systems. Now you know that the atmosphere has got length scales and time scales which are rather different from what happens in the lithosphere essentially. We also know that the energy sources are essentially the internal heat and the external heat, right? I'm trying to touch on the basics, the way I think about the Earth's surface. And I'll keep humans out of this discussion for now. We'll keep the humans, we'll bring in the humans at a later point. <clears throat> so what then is the Earth's surface minus the, minus the humans, <clears throat> okay? The Earth's surface is the boundary between rock put in motion by deep geophysical processes, that is thermomechanical motions within the Earth, right? <clears throat> gravitational heat, radioactive heat, <clears throat> and the atmosphere put in motion by the solar heating process, okay? Neither motion is steady, non-uniformity, and non-steadiness of these processes. And the time scales on which tectonic processes operate, the time scales on which climate processes operate, and the time scales, and I'll still keep humans out, but I have kept that here essentially, but human time scales are again very different essentially, right? <clears throat> so there are three time scales that are intersecting for anything that happens at the surface of the Earth, essentially. <clears throat> so what are the common features that happen in most geomorphic realms? The surface materials most often move in one direction prior to emergence at the surface, there's vertical motion, near surface, exhumation. And that's how uh, the material of the Earth, the inner uh, <clears throat> materials of the Earth get to the surface of the Earth. Materials are transformed as they move through the system, both mechanically and chemically. They go through screen size reduction, mud can aggregate, and chemical transformations can take place <coughs> in multiple ways. Motion is generally concentrative, river networks, glacial networks, and so on. Material gathers itself in more efficient streams, ultimately leading to some kind of self-organization. And with time, Material flow is adjusted to the transport that's supplied to it, and we use the principles of conservation of mass, energy, and momentum. This, in brief, is essentially what we do in Earth surface processes or in trying to understand Earth surface processes. <clears throat> now, a couple of years ago, there was uh, a booklet, I can't remember, it was the NSF, maybe, Landscapes on the Edge, they called it. If you haven't seen it, you can download it. And these are the questions that were asked in that. What are the questions which are important in the area of Earth surface processes? What does our planet's past tell us about its future? So can we read the future from its past? How do geopatterns on Earth surface arise and what do they tell us about processes? Deserts seem to show some pattern, glaciers seem to show some pattern, rivers, Meandering rivers show some patterns. So these patterns are recurrent patterns and they are related to processes. How do landscapes influence and record climate and tectonics? How can you read the climate and tectonic signals from landscapes? And how does the biogeochemical reactor, which is weathering of the Earth's surface, respond to and shape landscapes from global to local scales? <laughs> What are the transport laws that govern the evolution of the Earth's surface? How do ecosystems and landscapes co-evolve? What controls landscape resilience to change? And then question number eight, which is a burning question. How will the Earth's surface evolve in the Anthropocene when humans come into the picture, actually? <clears throat> and how can ESS, or Earth surface studies, uh, uh, Earth system science, contribute towards a sustainable Earth surface. And this is all about, you know, living on a sustainable planet, actually. 
Now, one of the very strong motivations for Earth surface processes has come from, let us say, in the last three decades, from studies which are relevant to climate change, essentially. So the motivations came from the first wave of climate science, where we know that climate is changing. I mean, Trump may not believe it. That's a different matter. But gen generally, it is believed, and the scientific community believes it. Climate is changing, causes known. Second wave is coming. What are the consequences and how to respond to it? And then, not only climate science, but the human use, the land use, essentially. So it's climate and land use together actually causing modifications in a big way in the natural system that we had outlined, which was dependent essentially on the interaction between climate, tectonics, and erosion. Right? So, uh, of course, for that, we need a quantitative understanding of processes and the records of past conditions, responses, et cetera. And that is what you guys have been doing over the last two weeks. <clears throat> so the key issues, therefore, whether you look at a natural system or you look at a human-impacted, human-disturbed natural system, you're talking in terms of linkages and fluxes. What are those linkages? How have we disturbed those linkages? Have we changed the fluxes? What are the timescales of processes on which these linkages and fluxes are operating, and are we changing those? And what, are, what is scale and connectivity? The question of scale and connectivity has already come up. Connectivity is kind of a borrowed concept from uh, other disciplines, but it has made its way into geomorphology. And in the last decade or so, there are n number of publications. So for the gentleman who wanted to know about indices and things of that kind of measurement of connectivity, I think you should read up Heckman's paper, Tobias Heckman's paper in, in ESR, which was a review paper which actually outlined a number of connectivity ind indices. <coughs> OK, now, still the Earth without human beings. And this is a diagram that comes from uh, a paper that Mike Leader wrote. And this is, what is it that sets the boundary conditions of, on Earth, of the surface of the Earth? The boundary condition is set by tectonics, ultimately, right? All your first order large scale topography is set by tectonics. What plays on that surface? is climate. And that gives rise to a first order interaction between tectonics and climate, essentially, right? <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, you have the greenhouse feedbacks. Climate gets determined by both orbital forcing, which is Milankovitch cycles, as well as greenhouse feedbacks, essentially. And of course, the insulation, also volcanism to a certain extent, all of that goes into the making of climate over a certain set of time, essentially. You create conditions of the physical atmosphere, of the chemical atmosphere, and these two together create a vegetation dynamics on the surface of the Earth. You ultimately get up a physical land surface, which you're studying, and a chemical land surface, rivers, glaciers, whatever, right? <clears throat> That's only the morphological aspect. And then you produce concentrative motion, and then you transfer material from the continents to the oceans, and you have a physical ocean set up, and you have a chemical ocean set up via the solutes, essentially, which are changing that. Now, that diagram is relatively simple. But once it comes to actually parameters, then you can see that each one of these boxes gets filled up with n number of parameters. And that's where the complexity arises, actually. Okay. <clears throat> so I think, uh, again, this was a paper in sedimentology leader 2011. And I'll point you out to that, because this is fundamental. So, so far, what I introduced was a notion of the Earth. And I pointed out in the beginning that the Earth and humans are an interacting system. But we talked only about the Earth and without humans on it, essentially. And now I'll start my journey with respect to the Anthropocene concept. How many of you are generally familiar with the Anthropocene concept? Four or five, not too many. Half a dozen people, OK. So there's a bit of history here. And I'll try and you know, take you through history as well. Earth is moving out of its current geological epoch, and that is the Holocene. How many of you know that the Holocene is a boundary between the Pleistocene and the Holocene? And that boundary was arrived on the basis of what? What is it that 
How did you define 11,700 years? Was it a climatic boundary? Was it a fossil, fossil based boundary? What kind of a boundary is it? Hmm? Sorry? Humans. No, 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 not as yet. The geological time scale is, you know, the Anthropocene is a new phenomenon. The Holocene came into existence 11,700 years based on climate. It is not a biological boundary. It is the only boundary which is climate-based. <coughs> now, you know, uh, there's a famous author, bestseller, The Tao of uh, Physics was his first book, 1974. And he wrote another book in 2014, essentially, The Systems View of Life. And I'll read this out to you. Our world today is dominated by a global economic system. So the humans are pursuing an economic system with disastrous social and environmental impacts. Predatory capitalism is what he has called it. We are the only species on Earth who destroys its own habitat. Mind you, these words are very profound. Think about them. Threatening countless other species with extinction in the process, essentially. <clears throat> There's a lot of profundity there. <clears throat> so then the question is, the Anthropocene in the 21st century, sustainability or collapse, where on earth are we going? Large-scale geoengineering solutions on one side. And of course, let's hope that is not where we are going, essentially. <clears throat> Today, Anthropocene has featured on common magazines like The Economist. The cover page of The Economist has this, Welcome to the Anthropocene. The Geological Society of America runs a popular magazine called the GSA Today. It's got this on the cover page, Are We Now Living in the Anthropocene? So the Anthropocene is something which is, you know, it's not just uh, confined to, let's say, the earth sciences community or the science community, but it has pervaded into economic, sociology, political science, policy, governance, you name it, literature. Best, prize books have been, uh, best prizes have been given for, for two books. One is called The Human Age, and the other is called Adventures in the Anthropocene. <clears throat> so you can see the magazine Le Monde, The Economist, and then enter the Anthropocene age of man. And just like the word DNA, the word Anthropocene has now destined to leap from the world of science into the global lexicon. That means common people talk about the Anthropocene. It's no longer something that is the preserve of scientists, essentially. <clears throat> now, who, 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 who revived this word, actually, right? It has a long history, actually. Paul Crutzen, who coined the term Anthropocene for a new geological era. And at that time, he wanted to wanted this beginning to coincide with the industrial era. Right? And you can see the reasons why he wrote many articles. And there's Bill Stephan, who has followed up with a lot of articles, and uh, how things have changed for carbon dioxide, for N2O, for methane, for ozone depletion, ocean ecosystem, so on. You can see that there is a big exponential change that is happening post-1800 in all these graphs, actually. And that led him to this. Historically, this is what happened. In the year 2000, there was a meeting happening of IGBP, which stands for the International Geosphere Biosphere Program. And in the IGBP Scientific Committee, Steering Committee, which was being held in Mexico, <coughs> there were people who were discussing the Holocene and talking about Holocene, essentially. And Paul Crutzen, who was already a Nobel laureate, was very fidgety and very uncomfortable. And he'd been kind of, for, for five minutes, kind of, it was there on his face. Then finally, he couldn't take it anymore. And he blurted out, stop using the word Holocene. We are not in the Holocene anymore. We are in the Anthropocene. <clears throat> this is what he said, actually, at that meeting. Anthropocene, it was quiet in the room for a while. Everybody went quiet for a while, actually, coming from somebody who was a celebrated person who was a Nobel laureate at that time. <clears throat> but history has it that Antonio Stopani, 1824 to 1891, actually spoke about the Anthropozoic era. 
And what did he have to say? Humanity is a new telluric force, which in power and universality may be compared to the greater forces of Earth. And this statement he had made as early as 1873, actually. And there was even somebody before that in 1864, actually. <clears throat> so the concept of the Anthropocene, or the idea of Anthropocene, though resurrected and rejuvenated in the year 2000, has a long prelude to it, actually. <clears throat> And the two one-page articles, or two-page articles, were the IGPP newsletter, uh, May 2000, where he formally used the word, the Anthropocene. And that's the Nobel laureate Paul Crutzen and Eugene Sturmer. Uh, that was the first time it was used. And then it was followed up by this one-page article in Nature. And that article was called Geology of Mankind. And that article is now a very well-cited paper. <clears throat> and in that, in that little inset over there is written, the Anthropocene can be said to have started in the late 18th century when analysis of air trapped in polar ice showed the beginning of growing global concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane, actually. So I think it was the uh, analysis of the ice cores the air entrapped in it, which led to this notion of the increased concentrations. And that's why they, they put it down at 1800. <clears throat> now, there were others who followed this up. Paul Crutzen is still an author on that. Bill Steffen, Paul Crutzen, and John McNeil, they wrote in the Ambio in 2007, the Anthropocene, are humans now overwhelming the great forces of nature? Plus, another article on catastrophic regime reshifts in ecosystems linking theory to observation, essentially. And these two very influential articles, one written in 2003 and one written in 2007, also moved the world towards the kind of stronger foundations for the Anthropocene concept. This lady has nothing to do with Earth system science. She is a Nobel laureate. She is a political econo economist. And in the year 2009, she got the, the Nobel Prize for Economics. And she talked about the governance of the commons, the economics of the commons. So she related poverty and commons and how to govern the commons. And if you leave it to the user community, that they will actually take care better than any governmental <coughs> governance systems. <clears throat> Her name is uh, Eleanor Ostrom. The concept of the Anthropocene heralds a profound shift in perception of our place in the world. This is what she had to say. And she also went on to say, centuries from now, the defining event of the 20th century may not be the great wars, the battle of ideologies, or even the industrial revolution per se. It may well be the ascendancy of a single species to become the dominant geological force in a single human lifetime. So let's look at it now. So that's global swarming, global warming, and global swarming. But you see the humans jam-packed on Earth, 7 point, how many billion now? 7.3, 7.4, whatever. But they are interacting with all these cycles that are happening on different time scales. There are geochemical cycles, hydrological cycles, temperature gradients, relative gradients, Milankovitch cycling, and then continental crust cycling, ocean crust cycling within the, within the uh, interior of the Earth. Right? So the humans are interacting with all of this, although the time scales are very, very different, essentially. <clears throat> so now we come to the anthroposphere, which is defined as the sum total of all the actions of all the human beings that are living and dead that are gone by, actually, in a modern world. <clears throat> so human transformation of the Earth and its fluid envelopes. And the questions that are being asked is, since when did this start? What is a good starting point? Is it 1950? Is it the year 1800? Or is it the beginning of agriculture 8,000 years ago? That's a question under debate. Actually, people take different viewpoints. When did it acquire global scale significance and start being at similar levels 
as natural material and, and energy flows. So we became a force which was as, uh, in terms of moving material and moving energy, as important as nature itself, actually. <clears throat> So the leader diagram and this diagram are different. Hydrosphere, lithosphere, atmosphere, biosphere. And now we plug in the, the human system, and that is where the anthroposphere comes in, essentially. Let's pause for a while and look at the way population on Earth has grown, essentially. How has population grown on Earth? If you look at the, the, this one tells you, essentially, about this spiral here going up like that from about uh, 1800 when we were about less than a billion and actually coming up. But if you look at this, every 12 to 15, you know, 1959, we were 3 billion. 1927, we were 2 billion. 1974, 4 billion. 1987, 5 billion. 1999, 6 billion. 2012, 7 billion. And the forecast is 8 billion for 2025 and in 2040, 9 billion. That's the forecast, essentially. So every 12 to 15 years, we are actually adding a billion. So that's the way the human population is going. And then, of course, <clears throat> we are hoping that we will stabilize at something between 9 and 10 billion between 2040 and 50, essentially. <clears throat> so that is the Earth on which we live. You and I live, essentially. We inhabit this Earth. People inside that triangle. Energy, food is our concern. Water is our concern keeping climate within its limit cycles is our concern, and managing the ecosystems is our concern. That is the Earth on which we dwell. And this is the famous Bretherton diagram now, in contrast with the, where there we were actually essentially focusing on tectonics, climate, and erosion, right? They were the natural system that we were talking about. And here, what are we talking about? We're talking largely about atmospheric physics dynamics, ocean dynamics, stratospheric climate dynamics, marine bi biogeochemistry, terrestrial ecosystem, soil, terrestrial moisture, evaporation, water, greenhouse gases, land use, tropospheric chemistry, pollutants, and biogeochemical systems. And the basics, you know, we're in terms of the lithosphere, volcanism, and sun occupy two little blobs over here. And the humans occupy a big, big red blob there, essentially. Right? <clears throat> so that is the change that you see from the leader diagram to the Bretherton diagram, actually. It's nice to juxtapose these on two sides of a, of a notebook and look at them together, actually. <clears throat> now, what are the time scales on which anthropogenic forcing takes place? You can see the solar heating, tectonic alterations, bolide impacts. Glacial interglacial cycles, which bribe the climate, climate essentially, are on time scales which are like 10 raised to the 5 to 20,000 years. And then anthropogenic forcings, regional and local, are, you know, and global is century scale, right? 100 years. Anthropogenic, 10 years. Anthropogenic forcing local could be even less than that, actually, right? <clears throat> So you're talking in terms of time scales on which modifications have occurred where humans have been successful in creating <coughs> rates which nature did not do, actually. <clears throat> and that brings us to the story of climate change, essentially, which is you know, sitting at the base of the idea of Anthropocene. <clears throat> and here, of course, is Mann's famous uh, 2003 99 papers and so on. So that 99 paper with all the uncertainties, et cetera. And that's where it is shooting up, the, the idea of global warming, where it's going beyond the envelope of natural variability. So now we should look at this change. Is this change something that has happened in the Holocene ever? Or it is something which is human induced, and we have done it, actually, right? So then the question arises. Let's look at the Holocene. So we extend our time scale back. 0 to 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. And you can see, if you look at this, from 100 to 20, it's all Milankovitch-driven cycles. It's all Milankovitch-driven cycles. The humans have not yet interfered with the system in any way, essentially. So these are the limit cycles. They will be called limit cycles as we go on. And then, of course, the last glacial maxima, for those of you who know about that. And then we come into the Holocene, which is 
Some people have called, called it the period of grace for humans. So we've stayed within those limits. <clears throat> we've stayed within those limits. <clears throat> we've not gone out of those limits, actually. Right? And that's humanity's 10,000 years of grace, which we have been kind of proliferating from less than a billion to 7.3 billion, and onward journey to 9 billion. <clears throat> So there we are, the temperature rise beyond the envelope of natural variability. And that is being ascribed to human influence. And the rates of change are staggering. Since 1970, the global average temperature has risen at a rate about 170 times the background rate over the past 7,000 years of the Holocene and in the opposite direction. The rate of atmospheric CO2 increase over the past two decades is about 100 times the maximum sustained rate during the last deglaciation. And the rate of increase in ocean acidification is unparalleled for at least the last 300 million years. <clears throat> right? The references, references are given below, actually, for those of you who are interested. So <clears throat> now that we know that we live on a warming globe, it has consequences. What are those consequences? Primary forcings, secondary forcings, surface process zones, and hazards. Another interesting paper, which was led by John Pellicier, with whose name you might be familiar now because of the quantitative geomorphology book, if somebody has mentioned that to you. And you can see the changes, of course, have been classified into primary, which is temperature, precipitation, wind systems, and land use. Right. Land use to a very large measure directly being impacted by the humans. And these indirectly because of the greenhouse gas emissions. Right? So the human hand is there in all of them, essentially. And the secondary forcings, which come from the primary forcings, are runoff, soil moisture, land cover, sea level, storm surge, wave height. And each one of them, and these are numbers here, one, two, three, four, five, six, these relate to the numbers here, essentially, surface processes where changes are happening in landslides, in wildfires, in soil erosion, in subsidence, in flooding, in bed bank erosion, water availability, water quality. Landsliding, subsidence, flooding, whether it is hill slope, whether it is fluvial, whether it is paraglacial, whether it is aeolian, particularly in terms of dust emissions, essentially and then coastal flooding, beach erosion, and the like, actually. So all of the Earth's surface processes are being impacted by the human hand somewhere or the other. So the primary forcing is there in that upper part. This is another paper, which is 2014, which I think we should be reading. As somebody who doesn't know any biology at all, I <coughs> ventured into trying to understand, because when you talk about land use and land cover, you need to finally understand what is happening around us, essentially. And there are these people, uh, Ellis and his group, essentially, and also Yadvinder Mali at the uh, University of Oxford. These people have been talking about this. Let's look at civilizational history a little bit. Civilizational history goes back to, let's say, 8,000, 9,000 years, agriculture beginnings, whatever. All of them, the Indus Valley, Mesopotamia, Egypt, you know. <coughs> And that's the spread of agricultural crops. The yellow colors essentially is 12,000 to 8,200 years. And the green color is 8,200 to 4,200 years. So the, you have tracked essentially through the Holocene period how we have kind of proceeded with agriculture. And then somebody has gone on to say, agriculture is the colonization of ecosystems. Right? So, the British colonized us at some point of time. But this is the colonization of ecosystems, essentially. This is a statement is coming from Mali. And so there are no biomes now. So we talk in terms of anthromes, right? <clears throat> so the ecosystem processes are mostly a function of human populations. It's we decide what happens to vegetation on, on the terrestrial surface of the Earth. And there are ecosystem interactions. So the ecosystem processes are therefore a function of population density 
and what land use we put it to, how land and resources are used essentially. <coughs> So you can see the biomes, anthropogenic biomes are called anthromes also. And this is a global map of anthromes now as opposed to biomes essentially. And this is an influential paper again in Proceedings National Academy of Sciences 2013 essentially by Elise, where again they talked about the used planet. And here in the used planet concept essentially, we are talking in terms of when did its first use start? 8,000 years ago, 5,000 to 8,000, 3,000 to 5,000, 2,000, and so on. Or is it as young as 100 to 250? Or is it even younger, less than 100, essentially? So we have classified the world, or classified the Earth, into its usage history, essentially, more in terms of actually conversion of the vegetational successions, essentially. <clears throat> and that's where we are with our terrestrial vertebrate biomass. Domesticated animals, 65%, humans, 32%, vertebrate wildlife, 3%. That's, again, there's a reference there, Smil 2002, for those of you who want to go there, essentially. <clears throat> so this then summarizes the long-term anthropogenic changes. From the natural megafaunal extinction just before the Holocene or at the time of the Holocene, beginning of the Holocene, into how crop and livestock domestication took place through Southwest Asia, North China, South China, Mexico, Peru, and so on. And then the spread of agriculture, forest clearance, soil erosion, atmospheric CO2, NH, CH4, ocean acidification, and then the bomb tests that came in 1945. <clears throat> So that's what we did with agriculture. What have we done with, with mining? <clears throat> we're taking out materials with excavation, essentially. Look at those numbers. Earth processes move 10 to 28 billion tons each year. The Broken Hill Proprietary Olympic <clears throat> Mining actually does 30 billion, did 30 billion tons in 40, million year, in 40 years, right? Just one company. That's the figure of one company, actually, BHP. All right? So you can imagine why it is now believed that we are competing with nature, actually. We are doing as well as nature is doing, or better still, actually. <clears throat> and look at the uh, human versus natural cycling of the elements, essentially. And the red color is for dominated, where greater than 50% of mobilization has been done. Perturbed, 15 to 50% of mobilization unperturbed, less than 15% of mobilization, and undetermined is the white ones, essentially. <clears throat> so you can see a lot of red there, actually. <clears throat> so now, chronologically, if you come, you can see that you have complex, multi-tired ecosystems with no one species dominating production and consumption in the biosphere. That is the big difference, essentially, between where we are and where we were and where we have gone, actually, right? So we'll not worry about humans. But look at this. Anatomically modern humans, 200,000 years. Culturally modern humans, 70 to 50,000 years. Domestication of plants and animals, around 14,000 years. Anthromes subsuming natural landscapes. This is the beginning, about 10,000 years. Beginning of urbanization, where you have civilization, 8,000 years. I don't, mechanized farming, around 1700. Industrial scale use of fossil fuels, 1700. Genetics, 1856. Concentration of humans in huge cities, 1900. The nitrogen fixation process, 1909. Green revolution, 1950s. And human population exceeds 7 billion, 2011. These are all bench benchmarks of what industrialization, what civilization means to us now, actually. <clears throat> So of course, take your pick, whether you want to take the beginning of the Anthropocene at the Neolithic Revolution, do you want to take it with the Industrial Revolution, or do you want to take it with the Great Acceleration at about 1950 or so, in the last 50 years? <clears throat> so now the question is, we are there, right? We have done what we wanted to do, 7 billion people, 7.5 billion people, you can't compress them, right? So now the debate starts, okay? 
Everybody in the world is worried. So if I'm a person in literature, I'm worried. If I'm somebody in economics, I'm worried. Everybody's worried. So from limits to growth, to carrying capacity, to guardrails, to tipping elements, these are the important phrases that are being talked about around us. To planetary boundaries, right? What is that safe operating space for humans, right? <clears throat> so uh, uh, Sheffer in 2017, so this is where we are with the glacial interglacial cycles, the climate limit cycles essentially, which we have spoken about. The Earth has moved out of that. It is sitting at the edge essentially. And it can have a trajectory which can go on to the hot, uh, uh, hothouse Earth and with no comeback, right? <clears throat> Are we headed there because we said two degrees? Two degrees, 450 ppm carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by whatever, 2050, limited to that, right? But we are racing away. We are at, what, 410, 420, something of that kind now. <clears throat> so, Huh? So, hothouse is a defined world? Or no, no, the hothouse earth is, of course, the trajectory, because if you keep on going at this rate, you're going to enter into the hothouse, essentially, right? But right now, what we are saying is that the, all the pundits, Mahapandits, have sat down and said, okay, if you want to limit it to two degrees of warming, which they think will be reasonable to do, is 450 ppmv, essentially. <laughs> So you have your glacial interglacial cycles. That's where the Earth is. And these guys actually, uh, Gaffney and Stefan, actually wrote a paper in Anthropocene Review. It was heavily criticized also by the mathematicians. But nevertheless, it, where A, G, and I, or change on the Earth, on the surface of the Earth, is astronomical forcings, geophysical forcing, and the Earth's internal dynamics, right? <clears throat> on the other hand, E is the Earth system. And H is the industrialized societies. So it's now essentially, they're saying that this is no longer operating. This is what is operating. D E by D T is, or change, is essentially a function of industri industrialized societies. <clears throat> Although this is no good. You can't operate with this mathematically. <clears throat> so this is the Anthropocene equation. That was the title of the paper. <clears throat> Mathematicians, remember, heavily criticized it because it is not an equation which can be worked out. <clears throat> the parameters are undefined, actually. <clears throat> so the Earth system trajectories. We have talked about the uh, we have talked about the glacial interglacial limit cycles over here, essentially, right? We have the Earth sitting somewhere here, just beyond those limit cycles now, right? So you can have uh, the human-induced emissions continuing, actually. Biosphere degradation, the planetary threshold. If you cross the planetary threshold, you enter the hothouse earth, essentially. And there are lots of nonlinearities which nobody knows, essentially. <clears throat> and then the Earth system stewardship, you know, is trying to bring this back and keep it here, actually, keep it as close to the limit cycle as possible. <clears throat> That's what the all this is, comes from the Stockholm Resilience Center. <clears throat> So then the idea of planetary boundaries, exploring the safe operating space for humanity. What is the safe operating space? <laughs> so here, of course, the human thinking about it now, finally. Ozone depletion, atmospheric aerosol loading, ocean acidification, global freshwater use, chemical pollution, land system change, rate of biodiversity loss, biogeochemical loading, global nitrogen and phosphorus cycles, and climate change. <laughs> there is a book written by Rockstrom. <clears throat> the title of that book, if I remember correctly, is, is Small Planet, Big World. <clears throat> right? <clears throat> so maybe some of you might want to look at that. <clears throat> and this is the so-called donut, the shape of a donut, essentially, where you have all the things which are being impacted negatively on the outer periphery. And then, of course, we are interested in a good social foundation, which is water, food, health, gender equality, social equality, energy, jobs, voice, resilience, education, income. And then, of course, the safe and just space for humanity, inclusive of and sustainable economic development, essentially. right? <clears throat> so an economy for the 21st century, the donut, a safe and just space for humanity, systems thinking, dynamic complexity, equity, 
distributive. It has to be distributive by design, actually. And it means a lot to revert our thinking to this way, essentially, of thinking. <coughs> Biosphere, regenerative by design, actually, right? We have to be regenerative by design. And it's nice to go back to tribal wisdom. Wilma Webb, who is from the Noongar people, indigenous Australians from elders, wisdom from Australia's indigenous leaders. This is what she had to say. We are only here for a short amount of time to do what we have been put here to do, which is to look after the country. We are only a tool in the cycle of things. We go out into the world and help keep the balance of nature. <clears throat> It's a big cycle of living with the land and then eventually going back to it. <clears throat> Ban Ki Moon, our foot is stuck on the accelerator and we are heading towards an abyss. <clears throat> Approaching a state shift in Earth's biosphere, this is Barnowski and a host of other authors. <clears throat> and you can see what is being plotted here is that the way the percentage of lightly affected ecosystems ecosystems becoming increasingly impacted from the year 1700 and projections on to 2025 where we would have impacted more than 50% and by 2045 when we are 9 billion people that and then they are worried about a critical transition as increased emergent global forcings reach threshold values that rapidly change all of Earth's ecosystems. So these are the kinds of things that are coming about actually and these are papers written in Science Nature, Science Advances, and PNP NAS, essentially, mostly. <clears throat> Is the Planet Full? There's another book, Ian Golden. And so, of course, there is this question of planetary stewardship, which is an alternative model, which is a different way of thinking it completely, actually, which will be, of course, you have poverty, you have infectious diseases, you have the coronavirus threat hanging already, fossil fuels, biodiversity loss, desertification, ocean dead zones, microplastics in the oceans, pollution, ozone, ozone acidification, the GHG problem. And then on the other side, water management, sustainable trade, sustainable cities, food security, forests, economic equity, renewable energy, education, and population, essentially. And the challenge is to shift values, essentially. <clears throat> this is for the green. That's for money. That's for the human brain. <coughs> OK, I'll leave you at that. <laughs> Any questions? So you can get some water to run. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, scientists have already established these uh, critical zone laboratories where they are looking at these rates of change, and I believe we have one here too. So what are the major findings that have come out from those, and is there any spatial variation across the world in different terms of rates, uh, pre-industrialized, post-industrializations? <clears throat> See, the critical zone laboratories do not have a history of more than two to three decades at, at most, essentially. The one that was established in India about two decades ago was in the Kabani watershed, which is a tributary in the Kaveri Basin, essentially. And the results, again, were very limited in their approach because they were looking at problems which are related to hydrology and the geochemistry of weathering. So these were the two aspects. Critical zone observatories are placed strategically in different climate zones and topographic zones, essentially in order that you are able to establish benchmarks, right, or baselines for what is existing now, actually, so that change into the future can be assessed. We're not assessing change from the past into now, right? So the very idea of the critical zone observatory is regarding baselines, right, establishing baselines. And in India now we have, and that is also well within the framework of, you can think of it within the framework of the larger concept of Anthropocene. And we have now maybe three which the NSES is operating, uh, one in the Western Ghats, one in the Kaveri Delta, uh, three plus one. One, I think, IIT Kanpur in the Pandu River, five 
and Vimal is one in the Himalaya, six, I think. Sir? Yeah. yeah. Sir, uh, uh, actually, I want to know that uh, uh, India has also targeted for Anthropocene, like uh, about for uh, 2030, we have to curve the carbon by 50% or we have to not uh, miss increase the temperature that uh, from 2 degrees centigrade. How you can uh, see the future scenario means uh, with respect see, to See, lip service is one thing, but actually getting down to doing something is another thing. Let's take the numbers, for instance. If you look, there is something called the annual greenhouse gas index, AGGI, actually. The AGGI is increasing annually at the rate of 2 ppm per annum, essentially, okay? Now, therefore, if you look at the values in 1990 or so, they were well below 400. Now, they are well, before, well above uh, 400. They are about 418 or so. Right, the carbon dioxide equivalent. So all the world's governments may say anything, but also look at the production figures of the oil industry. Are the production figures of the oil industry going down? You can answer that question yourself. Are, are the thermal power plants in India going down? Right? Is the efficiency or the you know kind of technology that is associated with the thermal power plants uh, increasing the efficiency? or it's still the oldest thing. Have we taken any steps towards uh, CCS, carbon uh, capture and uh, storage and sequestration, right? No, we haven't, right? So the answer is there. I will not give you a direct answer, but you can infer from what I've said. <laughs> No, it's not doomsday. <laughs> you don't have to be so quiet. <laughs> uh, sir, I have a rather generic question. So as now we are already accepting the idea of Anthropocene, but somewhere on the horizon we see now a threat of highly intelligent machines. What? Highly intelligent, intelligent machines. machines. Highly intelligent machines. Sorry. And which can learn by themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So where do you see the future like in maybe next 50 years or hundred years, whether we will be still talking I about... I can only Andrew. pray to God that the intelligent machines are more intelligent than the human beings <laughs> <laughs> and know how to coexist with nature. <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, I don't know really, I mean, it's very difficult to, uh, to really, uh, you know, there are, of course, uh, in term, today, I mean, in the world of machine learning and artificial intelligence and then moving in that direction and, and actually, uh, you know, probably having these, these robots which will probably think better than us because they will be able to uh, assimilate things which are you know, at a faster speed than what the brain can do. It's not possible to make any comment on the relationship of that machine with the complex natural interactions that are taking place, actually. <laughs> we can only express hope. <laughs> yeah, Nanya. The Anthropocene problem, as scientists, we are aware of it and we have started uh, being concerned. But somehow we have failed to uh, make the policymakers notice this thing and take action. And similarly, we, have, we do not have a proper connection with the uh, world outside, the general public, who are not very aware of these things and who are not concerned at all. So there is a connection gap over here. And as scientists, isn't this our responsibility to like formulate a way to communicate it to the public especially? You know the Nobel Prize that uh, I mentioned in economics, 2009? Yes, Ilian, Ilian Eleanor yeah. uh, Ostrom. <coughs> read, read about her. You know what she said? She said, leave the fish to the fishermen. They know how to manage it. They will not let the stocks deplete. They will make sure that there is enough for them to eat. Right? Similarly, leave it to the, the forest people. Right? So there are things which people have talked about, models which are alternative models. The question is, how do you adopt those alternative models? Something has come here to stay in the last 300 years. The industrial era has been there with us for 250 years, essentially, right? 
Now, how do you dismantle something which is 250 years old? Yeah. If there is no electricity in this room, will you allow the thermal power station to shut down and have the campus going without uh, electricity? You won't, right? So I don't think, you know, I mean, whilst we are, you know, I mean, this talk is not about, you know, putting everything into reverse care or talking about doomsday. This is about learning what the word Anthropocene means to the world today, actually, right? What it means to different communities within science. How do you view it as an earth scientist? How do you view it in terms of planetary boundaries? How do you view it in terms of the glacial interglacial cycles? How many people in science are wor worried about Milankovitch and glacial interglacial cycling, essentially, and limit cycles, right? And can we actually think in terms of what has happened to global warming in terms of those limit cycles, right? So that's where the science is for us, OK? That's where what is impacting is, again, as I said, that paper in Earth's Future, which is an AGU publication, essentially, is taking us to what is happening in the natural systems because of the primary forcing kick-starting the, the secondary forcings, and in turn, causing wildfires. Wildfires, in turn, increasing the debris flow, and debris flows, in turn, causing the flooding, right? And there are so many nonlinearities embedded in the system over here, essentially. So it's not just about, you know, I mean, so you can, within that larger framework of the Anthropocene, you need to think in your own little pocket, you know, the ones who are working on debris flows, essentially, will connect it with the wildfires. And the wildfires are a consequence of moisture deficit, groundwater depletion, and increase in temperature. All right? <clears throat> So there is that route which one has to take, one has to think, essentially. And therefore, the important thing, actually, the point that was being made in that paper was that the Earth's surface community does its models at scales which are very different from the Earth system modelers, ESM people. So ESM and the Earth surface process people don't gel at all, actually, because the scales are very different. And so the plea that they were making essentially was for these two communities to come together to solve problems which are real problems in Earth surface dynamics. So I kindly explain a little bit about this word I came across this art stored seep. So art to art stewardship, stewardship. Oh, stewardship. What is the Stu what is the idea behind this? And Planetary what stewardship. Is the you see, I mean, stewardship is, I mean, if you look at the planet now, right? And we want to have a sustainable planet, right? You don't want to have an unsustainable planet, right? If you want to have a sustainable planet, they, you have to provide certain leadership, thought leadership, essentially. Okay. So stewardship is. How do you direct? How do you lead? Right? So stewardship is nothing else. You can, you can say planetary leadership or planetary directions for sustainability. You can put alternative words there, essentially. Stewardship is just that meaning, essentially. That we have to redirect our thinking <coughs> in a way in which the Earth's surface is sustainable. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, since you talked about Milankovitch cycle, yeah. I just want to know one thing. I read in an article, I just remember, I can't remember which article right now. Uh, are we heading towards a grand solar minima, uh, which will ultimately lead to glacial and this greenhouse thing is delaying that thing? See, the, when you talk in terms, you have um, uh, eccentricity, tilt, and precession. Eccentricity is 100,000, 400,000, tilt is 41,000 and precision is 19 and 23,000. The solar uh, cycles are about 11 years and so on, right? Now, there can be a coincidence of the 11-year cycle with the ETP configuration, essentially, right? And therefore, in the last 400 years, 500 years, Maunder minima and so on, you know, there are several minima and you, can, you, can, you will talk about there, essentially. But the driving mechanism ultimately is the ETP, right? The ETP configuration determines the amount of insulation that is coming onto the surface of the Earth. What, at that point in time, how the solar minima interact with it also matter, essentially, in the insulation. But by themselves, no. It is, it is a minor cycle super, superimposed on the major cycle. And the major cycle will give you a configuration and an insulation, actually. <coughs> Uh, 
Yeah, about the impact. We have seen the Anthropocene impact is global, but its impact may be variable from place to place. So the spatial variability may be there. And with this reference, my question is that do we have some data from, from India about Anthropocene and what kind of impacts are there or any published work? Or this is... Uh, At ICER Bhopal, I asked my colleagues and my students, please do me a favor. 1947 was our independence. Let us take 1950. Can you tell me the total amount of excavation that has been done for mining purposes in Madhya Pradesh, in the geographical area as defined by Madhya Pradesh? Right? 1950, we take as the great acceleration. I could not have, and I threw that as a challenge six months ago. I took the Meripas answer. I have a good answer. I have a good answer. Kiske pass a good number. The data exists. Secondary data exists all over the place, essentially, but somebody has to locate it. Right? For the country, Germany, there is a paper which is there in my computer, Mineral Resources, Resource Extraction, where people have modeled that over a 10-year period, what is the total amount of excavation that has taken place? Right? We don't even have the primary data on what is the amount of excavation. There's a huge amount of excavation. You take dams, you take engineering projects, the large interventions. Where is our data? You work with rivers, you tell me where the sediment degradation data is on how much of uh, is, is stored actually and how much is, you see we are not increasing the sedimentation in the delta. That's the global figures essentially. Sibitsky and others always say this that the deltas are sinking actually. <laughs> right? They're not degrading. <laughs> yeah, Bodo, the tough one. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you for that, that summary. Um, uh, I really enjoyed the way how you put this together and I, ha I have a question and maybe you can help me and I, I start out by say, saying that I um, uh, have certain run-ins with Rockstrom who now moved to Potsdam, you know, he's in Potsdam who? since two, two years. Who? Uh, 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 Jan Rockstrom, the guy with the pl planetary boundaries, uh -huh, uh, Rockstrom, so yeah. he, he's now at the PIC, uh, the, the head of the PIC uh -huh. and, um, you know, I have no problem at all with the notion of um, that we are pushing the planet and that we are um, uh, uh, pushing the envelope and that we certainly need to make sure that we uh, uh, take care of the climate. Um, what I'm noticing so is that that community that is driving that effort, that community that is driving the Anthropocene effort and the community that is driving the planetary boundary effort, uh, is driven by physicists and modelers. These are no earth scientists. You know, I'm still an old school earth scientist that goes out so, to so the field. I. Yeah, yeah. I, I know, I know. <laughs> so, and, and I, I worry a little that um, the future of potentially earth sciences is dictated by people who can do the modeling really, really well, but who are not the ones that go out to the field and either read the landscape or understand the processes. They have, you know, there is no question that they have an excellent, uh, competent way of putting equations and solving them numerically. No question, you know, better than any one of us could do. But um, uh, there is also that notion that you understand the system dynamics by looking at the system, by observing it. And if I hear John Rückström talk about the, uh, um, the planetary boundaries, and I've seen several talks of him, it's all about what we can model and what we can't model, we, we don't even talk about. And, and I'm wondering if, if there is somehow a way that we can make sure that Earth sciences, the observations of Earth sciences, still continue to, to play a role in, 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 in the field. I think the, the uh, if you want, a, I can give you a more detailed answer, but a one-line answer would be that it boils down to scale. They are talking in terms of global scale issues, and they are looking at, ESM models essentially at the Earth scale, at the globe scale. Whereas when it comes to people like us, we are looking at a single valley or mm -hmm. a single basin essentially, right? And I don't think we can dispense with that because ultimately the local community is interested in the valley, in the slope, and that single debris flow or mud flow that comes and kills them, right? It is not about the global scale model essentially, right? Yeah, yeah. So I think the two are important. 
Uh, and as somebody said, the twain shall never meet, <laughs> or the twain shall meet. I do not know whether the two should meet. But I guess I think both have their own working envelopes and scales of operation. And as far as uh, the local scale is concerned, that's what Vikrant also raised. I think most of our problems will, I mean, if, for instance, if you're talking in terms of landslides in Kerala, I think we need to understand the Western Ghat dynamics, the lithosphere there, and the rainfall patterns there, and the vegetation dynamics there, actually, right? I mean, if the Earth, uh, Earth systems model, ESM is telling us something which is contrarian to the local uh, you know, data, I think I will reject the ESM and go by the... Yes, yes, but you know, if I look at the Earth system models that are developed at the PIC, for example, in that working group from, from Jan Rockstorm, you know, when I talk to those people and I ask them, hey, what about the 1960 earthquake, the largest one that happened in that century, the instrumental record, or what about the uh, Southeast Asian uh, Indian tsunami that occurred? Um, you know, they're not even considering the lithosphere as being part of the planetary boundary. And that somehow had me worried in the sense of that part of the future is being dictated by, uh, by, by uh, a community that has uh, not that solid earth science understanding. And I, I my, do think it's My important. take on that is that we continue to learn what they are telling us. But our business is our business. They can, they can probably never perform the way we perform at the local scale, mm -hmm. essentially. OK, right? that's true. Yeah. So I think the questions that we raise, we think at, the, at that scale, essentially, are relevant, relevant to communities, local communities, essentially. And they need solution at that level, actually, right? And mm -hmm. notwithstanding having said that, you know, we cannot underplay the importance of trying to obtain an understanding of what the cumulative effect of all our actions are on this globe, right? So we have to play both the games. Yeah, that's yeah so with this, if there's no other question, we thanks again to Professor Tanner, sir, for, for the excellent talk. So now we'll be break for tea, and then uh, we'll meet uh, maybe after 15, 20 minutes. 15, 20.